out and about. And now, here's your host, internationally known sportsman, Mark Fleming. Hi, this is Mark Fleming again with Out and About. And this week, I'll be taking you sail fishing in Cozumel, Mexico. I'm Bill Bowser, and I'll be giving you information on Out and About's club giveaway. Share a spot on the tournament trail with bass fishing professional Paul Elias. Stock white-tailed deer in South Texas with a camera. The scenic Great Smoky Mountains are explored on horseback. Plus instruction and a tournament for the smaller angler. What's new for the upcoming year in tackle at the AFMA show? And underwater macro photography techniques are demonstrated on the island of Antigua. Plus, we'll have some exciting Alaskan adventures. Cozumel, Mexico, on Yucatan's peninsula, is one of the greatest centers in the world for sailfish. Pretty fish. That's a good one there! Get him. There you go. Right there. Don't stop me. Don't stop me. Don't stop me. Don't stop me. I'm not. I'm not. Woo! Right. Look, Edna. Beautiful. Woo! Got him, buddy. Over here, Rush. Sailfish are especially challenging, especially on light tackle. Woo! Look at that! That fish is still taking line, Russ. At certain times Woo! of the year. Look at that! As many as 150 sailfish can be caught in a week's time. Woo! Oh! All right! You know, Kemp, we've been together now a number of years chasing these billfish all over the Caribbean, I guess, and every time we go out, it just seems to be more of a thrill for me. Uh, I know it is for you. Fish from sun up, sun down a lot of times, day in, day out. You get into these fish and you get one hooked up, and they start screaming off line. It really is, it's just one of the most incredible feelings a man could ever have. It's, uh, I, I know down here as an angler, and I feel the, the brute force of this fish in my hand. I think, sometimes I think to myself, it's the only sport a man can get into anymore that's not a non-contact sport, where he can feel his opponent's grace and, and power like this, you know? The waters of Cozumel contain so many species of fish that you never know what you may catch. Now, over the years here on Out and About, you've heard us stress catch and release. And it's a good policy. But in this case, for a dolphin or a mahi-mahi, we're going to make an exception. After all, the dolphin is a great food fish. The spectacular sailfish is one of man's greatest opponents in the angling world. Speed and power combined to make the sail a sought-after trophy. Many tournaments are held each year to pit man against this fish, and we're happy to report that most now have a catch-and-release policy good protection for future generations of fishermen, and the mighty sailfish. If fishing's not your interest, Cozumel offers a myriad of activities, such as diving, sailing, and great nightlife. Visit Mayan ruins, or just sit in the sun. Cozumel has something for everyone. And now a look at a new kind of Alaskan adventure called flight seeing. A helicopter service in Anchorage has even choreographed its popular scenic flights to music. Which planes often take visitors from Anchorage to wilderness lodges or fishing retreats? Are to marvel at the site of Mount McKinley, America's tallest peak. 
Another favorite destination for flight seers is the Columbia Glacier on Prince William Sound, 40 miles long and rising 250 feet above the bay. A close-up of the Ice Age in retreat. Perhaps the most exciting form of flight scene is by balloon. Anchorage, in fact, is a major year-round ballooning center. The winter climate is surprisingly mild, roughly the same as Detroit's. Alaska's scenic wonders are even more beautiful from a gondola. The silence broken only by the barking of a dog team racing through the woods below. We'll be back with Paul Elias and more after this. Those of you who follow the professional bass circuit know that there's just a handful of names that continually pop up at the top of the winner's list. Paul Elias is one of them. Today on Out and About, Paul is going to show us several new techniques. One, kneeling and reeling, is his invention has helped him win hundreds of thousands of dollars on the professional circuit. Highland Marina at West Point Lake in LaGrange, Georgia, currently is considered the hottest summer lake in the United States. I feel like the most important thing and the best time to learn is when you're on the water. You can, you can read magazine articles and read books and you're going to learn something and it's good to read them. But turning around and going out on the lake and trying what you read in the, in the article is where you're going to get the true experience. Once Paul locates a condition, an area, structure, a situation that he considers likely to hold fish, he begins his kneeling and reeling one of the most labor-intensive systems for catching fish I've ever seen. With super long casts and an extra fast retrieve in the first five or six cranks, Paul's able to get a crankbait down much deeper than it was supposed to run. When is the best time to use this technique? I kind of play it by ear and I use the technique when, like when I'm crankbait fishing and my strikes are coming closer to the boat, that means that my plug's down maximum depth. So I'm going to get down and try to get that thing a little deeper and see if there's any fish down deeper since the fish are seem to be striking deeper anyway. Just a slow, steady retrieve and that, that bait will bump bottom 10, 12, 14 feet deep and it's, you can bring it down there as slow as a worm. You know, it, and sometimes that's what it takes to catch it. In this case, the technique works really well as Paul hangs a nice fish from relatively deep water. Whoa, boy. Boy, he's in a bad way to hand, ain't he? <laughs> Come on. Big old treble hooks. A great time to leave the net at home, Paul. <laughs> Be careful, those hooks are sharp. Well, Biggin, don't you want to go back? Well, I'll tell you what, that was... Uh... That was fun right there. It's a real nice fish, and boy, he freight trained it. Go on, baby. Go on back and tell the rest of them to come eat big ants. <laughs> Trying new techniques can have surprising results for the angler, but how you put them to use may give you the edge. Mark recently saw firsthand man's effort to aid endangered species on a preserve in South Texas. record game, living and thriving again on a one million acre ranch. In the area also thrive many exotic animals, animals that perhaps don't even exist on their native continent. For the photographer, nothing stirs the heart quite so much as the sight of a wide rack camouflaged against the trees. There are very few game animals that throughout history have fed and clothed man as efficiently as the deer. 
revered for his cunning and strength, the deer maintains his proud bearing and aloofness in the face of danger. Protective of his territory, the deer's ability to evade the enemy makes him a unique challenge. With a keen sense of smell and sight, the deer is one animal that is very rarely surprised by man's invasion into his domain. Able to jump incredible heights and maintain a run for a long period of time, this noble creature is irreplaceable in the animal kingdom. Another animal that was imported into South Texas from Europe years ago is the Russian boar. He sometimes attains a weight of 450 pounds and is probably the most respected animal in South Texas. The world we live in is becoming more complicated every day. It's a toss-up between Shall we take care of the needs of man, or shall we save several species of animal? When the battles wage, there are victories on each side. What we have seen in South Texas gives us all cause for hope in that now we know that someone cares. We'll be back with a visit to the Great Smoky Mountains after this. Saddle up and head for the mountains. The entire family will enjoy this trip into the Great Smoky Mountains. These mountains have been the backdrop for much of the greatest hunting and fishing lure in the United States. The Smokies annually draw more visitors than any other national park. The breathtaking beauty of waterfalls and the mountain vistas will captivate you. This is one of the most scenic rides into the mountains. Winding through shady trails that parallel clear running streams, you are immediately transported to another time when life was slower and man's link to travel was his horse. The length of trips vary, some feature overnight camping. Surrounded by nature, it's easy to forget the nine to five routine and simply enjoy the beauty around you. Bring a camera, wildlife abounds, as do many flowers and trees indigenous only to this region. Of course, there are many other activities to enjoy. Square dancing, camping, swimming, backpacking, whitewater rafting, and in the winter, skiing. It's just another part of America's great beauty. Take along a fly rod and try your hand at catching rainbow or brown trout. These cunning beauties can be found in small rock pools, and tempting them from their secure haven is a lesson in patience. The lighter the tackle, the more fun you'll have. Laced with rivers and teeming with wildlife, the Great Smoky Mountains are a monument to man's ability to protect instead of destroy one of nature's greatest treasures. A few hundred miles away, Mark has the opportunity to participate in a unique new tournament for youngsters. Children of all ages gathered near Atlanta for the second annual Out and About Youth Fishing Derby. What an event. The derby itself is unique in that it's the first derby of its kind in the United States to offer a combination of both instruction and a fishing contest. There are seven stations where the students will learn about fishing from professional fishermen, Trout Unlimited, the Georgia Department of Fish and Game, and many other interested parties. Well over 1,500 people attended. Our class today will be taught by Cliff Craft, nationally known fisherman. Cliff, we get to hang around at a lot of these super bass tournaments. What's the special thing about a small tournament like this one? We, we guys that's got the $15,000 bass boats now, we started out fishing like these guys that are behind us here. And uh, without day learning how to fish, then there's no need for that $15,000 boat except to impress your neighbor. Mm -hmm. But uh, this, this is where it's all about. A lot of fun. There's more guys that are fishing uh, from the bank like we're doing today than fish out of those $15,000 boats. So it's a lot of fun. 
This is a special kind of tournament because there's instruction involved too, isn't there? That's right, and it's quick here because we can maybe teach the kids something, and then 30 minutes later they'll be out there fishing and applying what, uh, applying what we maybe can teach them. And if we do so in a clinic or something in the wintertime, and it might be three months later, well, gosh, they forgot by then. I would. Demonstrations on lure selection and species identification as well as taxidermy and boating safety make this event a trend we hope will continue. When it comes to fishing, you're never too old to learn. Even the manufacturers must gather once a year to keep themselves state-of-the-art in the ever-changing world of angling. It could be said that the entire tackle industry revolves around one single event. It's called the American Federation of Tackle Manufacturers Association Convention. And it's a big one. This is the tackle show for the industry. This is where the entire industry comes together. Manufacturers, wholesalers, mass merchandisers, retailers, media. This is where it all starts for the coming year. We're uh, delighted with what we've done with uh, a basic minnow, make it swim, and a crawfish or shrimp, and make it swim. When you're talking about fishing, you need power, strength, and sensitivity, and that's the things that, that a graphite rod would afford that fiberglass doesn't. We like to think that we stay out on the cutting edge of all the new innovations in fishing lures, and yes, uh, it's took about 20 years to get where we are. I've been in the lure business about 20 years. The nice thing about Porta Boat is that they don't give up anything in order for the portability. This boat will do anything that an ordinary boat will do, and in fact, it'll do it better. Well, Mark, as you probably know, we pioneered sport fishing sonar, and uh, from those very beginnings where we made the breakthroughs with the first portable products, the first high-frequency, high-resolution products, the first to guarantee to show individual fish and all, we have never slowed up on innovation and pushing forward. We're always breaking through that new frontier in technology, and we must do this because we have had considerable competition. Nobody really knows what color the fish sees. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. We can say we do all we want to. We do know that at times you'll hit one color better than the other. There's now even some makers with uh, computers on their reels. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not this is a gimmick, I don't know. But more and more the public is becoming aware of equipment that's lighter, faster, and stronger, and more functional. And next, visit an island with over 200 undiscovered shipwrecks. And Alaska's eagles. More bald eagles gather in a preserve near Haines, Alaska than in any other place in the world. In late fall and winter, as many as 3,500 eagles gather in the Chilkat Valley. The reason is food. Plenty of spawned out chum salmon. Warm water wells up and keeps some six miles of the river from freezing. The fish make a late run and spawn on the gravel beds. We get a pretty enthusiastic response. It's, uh, it's a pretty phenomenal sight, and people getting off the ferry, driving up into interior Alaska, coming across a place where they can see two or three hundred bald eagles at any one place is pretty ecstatic. It's something that I haven't quite got used to yet. I suspect if I spend the rest of my life here, and uh, drive up valley and take a look around. Uh, I'll never quite get used to the sight. It gives me a pretty, uh, pretty proud feeling, pretty happy feeling to come up here and see something like this still existing. These flying symbols of American patriotism provide real life inspiration in the Chilkat Valley. Some of the world's greatest diving is in Antigua. Once home to the English fleet, Antigua now boasts a modern city rich in historical value. Lord Nelson of England settled here when captain of the HMS Boreas as acting commander-in-chief for the Leeward Island Station in 1786. There's something for everyone here and some of the finest diving in the world. Whether enjoying the 365 beaches at your disposal, one for every day of the year, sailing on a small boat or a pirate ship, Antigua is magnificent. Aboard the Jolly Roger, an authentic reproduction of a Spanish galleon, day sailors enjoy a spectacular view of the mountains or a day's snorkeling. On this visit, Ellsworth Boyd of Skin Diver Magazine accompanies the out and about crew. I've done a lot of diving while I've been here, but I've just touched the tip of the iceberg. And I'll tell you, I don't want to go home, but I guarantee you one thing, I'm going to be back and be back very soon to explore the wrecks of this fantastic Caribbean island. 
Diving equipment is available on the island, but bring your dive certificate and your own mask fins and snorkel for added pleasure. Now, let's go diving. Oh, I think it's, the diving is excellent. Absolutely excellent. You hear so many different things about the different islands, and to me, seeing is believing. But what we saw was wildly beyond my expectations. So six of us suited up. We went overboard, went down to 60 feet. The reef rises up off the sand, maybe 15 to 30 feet. And John beckoned to us to follow him. We hadn't been in the water five minutes. We looked up under a cave. There were 12 schoolmasters. Schoolmaster is a type of a snapper that you may see him a foot, foot and a half. 12 schoolmasters about two and a half feet long, kind of holding a little school session of their own. So I got my camera and my flash up under there and got a lot of good pictures. We saw some polar coral. It's a tall, slender coral. It comes up, oh, sometimes maybe three or four feet high off the reef. Tower Carl is just beautiful. You don't see it on all of the reefs of the different islands. This is the only occasion when man may enjoy weightlessness and less in outer space. From unusual and irregular coral formations to sheer wall drop-offs. The Caribbean reef also offers plant and marine life never witnessed by most of the world's population. This week on Out and About, you've seen many exciting activities. We bring to you the art of recreation. One of the things that man sometimes forgets is that two-thirds of his world is composed of water, the home of millions of undersea animals. Join me, Mark Fleming, week after week as we take you to places and adventures that are truly out and about. about. And now, here's your host, internationally known sportsman, Mark Fleming. Hi, this is Mark Fleming again with Out and About. And this week, we'll take you to fish the virgin jungle rivers of Belize. Hi, this is Sue Morgan. We'll be going to upstate New York for world record class brown trout. And you'll also have a chance to sample one of the most unique train rides in the world, from Alaska. This week, I'll be fishing with my good friend, Mike Kendrick, Manatee Lodge in Belize, Central America. We'll be after that elusive snook and the fighting tarpon. We'll try for him on fly rod, casting, and spinning tackle. And we hope we'll have a week that you'll truly enjoy. I'll tell you what, Mike, they're in this bank. Wait, hold it, hold it. Yeah. Got him? He won't, he, he's, he's, he's up under the... Get him out. Get him out. He's heading for, he's heading for the... 
think, okay, I got him out. I turned him. Like this. He, he, he just, he's not moving. Strike's working all right. He's just a heavy yeah. fish. You know, we're, we're bumping this thing off the bottom. We, we are just liable to, uh oh, it is the drag. Look. You know, we were bumping this thing off the bottom of those rocks at the bar mine. And that, this could be. Look at this thing. It's black and hole. Don't talk to too much with it. That drag. I bet this is a big snapper. <laughs> was just a heavy fish. Fantastic. Mr. John, is that a Nassau grouper? Yeah, buddy, huh? That is an incredible that fish. That is a huge fish. Oh, Phil, how... <laughs> All right. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> He's going to knock oh. you right out of the boat. Can you imagine this catch? Mark, look what a mouth. Look at this mouth. Now, there are cases of scuba divers who go out and actually dive trying to spearfish these things, and they run into these fish that are so big that it scares the Whoa. divers away. Imagine that. If you look down in him, he's got crabs and shrimp and all kinds of stuff. Let's hold him up again, Mike, and let's see if we can get an idea of just exactly what size that fish is. Isn't that beautiful? Look how thick that fish is. Well, we're going to eat good tonight. This is some oh, of the greatest eating fish in the world. Congratulations again. That's great. And we'll be right back right after we take time out for these important messages. Twenty years ago, everyone thought that the Great Lakes had truly died. But here in upstate New York, we see that that's just not true anymore. Lake Ontario and its tributaries provide a unique opportunity to catch trophy brown trout and various species of salmon. The action can be fast and furious. We're here with John Denbeck, and John, when we talk about fishing for brown trout, probably the most elusive of all the trouts, mm -hmm. we have to remember that during the spawning period, they're not really eating too well. So how do we go about now trying to talk somebody into eating that really isn't hungry? Okay, when they're on a spawning run, they get very aggressive. They act much like salmon instead of trout. And they become very territorial. Uh, the males are fighting over females, females driving other females off their nest. So they resent any object or living thing intruding on their space. So you exploit their territoriality, plus try to st stimulate their curiosity. The presentation is everything, isn't it? Exactly. Um, they do not, they're not gonna hunt down food. So you have to put the fly at eye level or even with their lateral line and as close to them as possible. So we're sight fishing, actually? Uh, in this case, in this small stream, yeah. Um, because on migratory fish, you can have a section of stream that is full of fish. 50 yards away, it could be barren. And you have to make every cast count and try to put as many drifts of the fly right in front of the fish as possible. For the fly fishermen, a short drive from the East Coast can produce exceptional game fish. From September through April, salmon, steelhead, and brown trout take flies and lures. The salmon run well from September to November, and large brown trout of 6 to 14 pounds accompany the salmon upstream. Each fall, the Oswego River probably has the largest concentration of trophy brown trout in the world. The smaller streams are especially suited to fly fishing and can provide trophy fish that are quite visible. Concentration is essential for a successful trip as the brown trout is wary of any offering, either from nature or from man. 
A terrific game fish, the brown trout is quite capable of racing upstream at a speed hard to match by the equipment-clad angler. The angler's performance and skill in both handling the fish and maneuvering a rocky stream bed can only be proven by the catch in hand. Seven, eight, or nine weight fly rods and large reels with 150 yards of backing are needed by the fly fisherman. Both floating lines and high desinking tips are useful, as well as the occasional use of high density shooting heads. Flies range in size from twos to twelves with both bright and dark dressings. Warm clothing and neoprene or insulated waders with felt or studs are essential for your safety and comfort. We are currently exploring the effectiveness of float tube fishing for large trout, salmon, and smallmouth bass along the Lake Ontario shoreline. Sounds like fun to me. We'll have a report soon. Brown trout fishing. It's hard, but when you've got a guy like John Denbeck showing you the ropes, we've learned a lot, and we're going to learn a lot more, this time about snook in Belize. It's the natural environment that you may have been looking for with basic comforts, but few of the typical tourist resort features you've come to associate with most other Caribbean vacation spots. Here, you come to fish. It really gives you workout on light tackle, doesn't it, Mike? It does. It's a, it does. That may be a jack. Whoa, there he goes again. Well, if he is, we'll give him one of my professional one-hand gaps and see if we can't call him in the boat. It sure is a big jack, Mike. A big jack. Oh, yeah. Now, put it back on something, cut off his side. Look, what? Look, behind his, look behind the other side of the fish. The other side. Oh! <laughs> you gonna make me catch him twice? <laughs> Oh, look here on this side where it's talking about something has cut him completely up. He was almost lunch for a big fish, I'm wasn't telling he? you. Well, I'll tell you, that's something when you got to catch him twice, isn't it? If you're not careful, you're going to make him catch him three times here. Well, let me turn that gaff over here. Oh, yeah. Another fine jack, gentlemen. Mr. John, would that be a shark or a barracuda or what that tore him up like that? Shark, probably. When I was bringing him in, or before that? Before. Okay, gentlemen. Another fine catch here at Manatee Lodge. I got him, Mark. being too big, he's sure putting up a whale of a struggle. <laughs> Those are just strong fish. They're sort of like me. You know, Mike, you know, you know, Mark, dynamite comes in small packages. That's what I've heard. <laughs> oh, oh, how you like that? <laughs> Jacks, tarpon, and we'll be back with the elusive snook right after this. Mark, I got another one. You lucky devil. Oh, me. Well, your arms ought to be oh. tired now. This is another nice look, Mike. Oh, he's barely hooked, too. Oh, no. Did you see? Oh, no. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> I told you he was barely hooked. Why didn't you put the big hook in him? <laughs> Oh, that's a shame. He done a job to my leader, though. I think this might be the last time I go fishing with the rookie.
of the day, they like to hang in under this undercut bank. And no matter what lure we've been throwing, it's got to be a lure that's been... Ooh, yes, sir. It's got to be a lure that sinks down and can get under that undercut for them to get it. Fine-looking snook, Mike. Well, that snook fooled me, because I thought that was a tarpon when he first came up over there. Isn't that a beautiful fish? He's lovely. That is a beautiful, beautiful fish. Let's let him go again and come uh, back another day. I let go my finger. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> now, over the course of the years and over the course oh, of... Oh, he's the... tired. Look at him. Yeah. Oh, there he goes. When releasing fish, always try to gaff them in a non-vital area. Oh, no. Not again. Mark, that's, what, three fish in a row, like, doing me that way. You have to understand, I've paid these fish off. Look at that leader. Now, you, you talk... Look at that. Now, that leader is scarred for six inches, solid six inches. That means that hook had to be, yeah. had to be in, in his mouth at least three or four inches, and they still come on. What we need to do is tie this gaff on the end of your line. Here, let me have it. <laughs> I'll do it. I'm going to have to retie again now. I think that's the nicest fish of the trip, too. I that one felt nicer than any of them. You know, I'm still trying to top your 20, what, 22? About 22 pounds. 22 pound snook from uh, the other day. Oh my goodness. You lucky dog. You got another strike? It's area. You must be doing something right. I went to that ladder later. But, you know, I think I'm... Look at that fish. But I think it's cost me those few that's got off. If I don't do like I've been doing those others and let them get off. Uh, just take your time and just don't... The only time you have to worry is if he starts making a beeline for the mangroves. As long as he stays out in the creek here, you've got a good shot. Whoa. But that is definitely a big fish. He's still going. Look at him. I can't he's not even turning him. He's still just swimming off. Try to pump him back a little bit. He's going toward those. Ooh, bro. Have you ever seen any fishing like this, Mike, anywhere in the world? Not anywhere. This is absolutely phenomenal. I think I may have turned a confirmed bass fisherman into a confirmed snook fisherman this well, week, Well, I tell you, whoa, what, I, what I love about it, it's just like bass fishing. I'm fishing with an artificial worm. I'm bouncing it off the bottom just like I do when I'm bass fishing. Son of a gun. Oh, no. Aha! Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a little lesson Immediately before that cast, Mike had had another strike. And he said, let me change the leader. Nah, they're hitting. Let me throw it. And as you can see, that has frayed off right at the lure. And I think, Mr. Kendrick, you've learned your lesson. My $20 fish. Boy, this sure has been an enjoyable trip. Oh, the entire trip has. Every day we've been into some fish. Yeah, yeah uh-huh. Oh, well, it's about time. He's <laughs> not hooked very good. You better use the gas. I've got it. Ease him up. Now, did I say that? I believe in catch and release, Go ahead. <laughs> but I like to look at him first. I'm sorry, my friend. I didn't want you to catch. I've been desperately trying for you not to get one today. So I accomplished what I meant to do. 
All in the interest of good sportsmanship. All in the interest of good sportsmanship. Okay. <laughs> Mark, got another one. There must be something moving through here. I just had a strike myself, Mike. Nope. Fine, coming under us here. Very good. Now that, this is a fighter here now. Oh, Mr. Don, let me, Mark, let me back up right here a little bit. Just the right away, as they say. Yeah. Oh, Back up front now. Yeah, he's taking me for a walk. As your white, oh, beautiful snook, Mark. Beautiful. Oh. As your wife asked me the other day, asked me if I was taking my snook for a walk. Uh huh. Oh, that one's barely hooked, also, Mark. Well, we'll just try to get him on this first pass by a little green, maybe. Is that? I love it. <laughs> that sure was a lucky gaff, wasn't it? I had him hooked in the gills. <clears throat> One thing oh. we might like to point out that these fish are biting so light that unless you sense it, you really don't even know you have a strike. That one. And I... this is proof of the pudding. You hooked him on the outside. Right. Just barely bounced against him. <clears throat> well, we've let 30 of these things go this week. Why don't we keep him for the pot? They're my favorite eating fish. I think I will. Okay, I very good will. job. Mr. John, would you take care of this gentleman for me here? Oh. And we'll be right back right after we take time out for these important messages. You know, Americans have always loved our railroads, and it's no different here in Alaska. You see, Alaska has one of the most unique railway systems in the world. The wilderness is what Alaska is all about. People come here from all over the world to view images which will last a lifetime, including Mount McKinley. Thanks to the Alaska Railroad, there's a comfortable way to share the wilderness experience. From a dome car, Visitors can drink in Alaska's scenic wonders. The Alaska Railroad's main line, operated by the U.S. Department of Transportation, runs between Anchorage and Fairbanks. Diesel locomotives cover the 360 miles in less than eight hours, unless there are moose on the tracks. But on the local run, there are many flag stops to move fishing or hunting gear, bring groceries, carry mail. One flag stop is right beside a fishing hole. We came up here on our and it just seemed, Alaska seemed like such an exciting place to go. Really a romantic wilderness. It's just been lovely coming up here. And it's kind of like a boat, only much nicer. I like the way it rolls. The system is an unquestioned success. For Alaskans, efficient transportation. For tourists, a vista dome view of Denali National Park and Mount McKinley. For the government, a system that pays its own way. A continent away, Belize is an angler's paradise. When fishing is slow, you may wait for a feeding spree, or you may troll to locate the fish. You may want to troll with much heavier equipment and 50-pound line in hope of landing a big snapper in the 30 to 50-pound range or a big grouper of over 100 pounds. Here, Jamie Claiborne catches a nice snook. Fly fishermen are welcome, but it's recommended that they fish one to a boat. Tarpon in the 300-pound world record class have been hooked here, and the 150 to 180-pound sizes have been landed. 
Other catches include snook to 35 pounds, 20 pound jack, 48 pound snapper, and grouper to 500 pounds. Formerly British Honduras, Belize belongs to that group of newly independent colonial nations that have escaped the rampant commercialism and resort development so common to the Caribbean area and Mexico during the past decade. Belize is so untouched that you still can catch some pretty spectacular species of fish here as well. Don't hoss him too much with it. That drag is slipping on you. I bet this is a big snapper. Or a yeah, big I don't grouper. think it's a snooper. I mean a snooper. <laughs> <laughs> a snooper. <laughs> and so, if you're looking for tarpon, snook, jack, snapper, or even a snooper, Manatee Lodge may be the place for you. And for now, this is your host, Mark Fleming, saying see you next time on Out and About. about. And now, here's your host, internationally known sportsman, Mark Fleming. Hi, this is Mark Fleming again with Out and About. And this week, you'll have an opportunity to see one of America's true legends, the Alaskan bush pilot. Hi, this is Sue Morgan. And this week, we'll be taking you marlin fishing with world-famous captain Billy Black at Walker's Key in the Bahamas. You'll also have an opportunity to see Alaska's Four Rendezvous. It's a yearly extravaganza, and you'll have a ringside seat for all the games. Also, we'll discover the world of record-class snook on a fly rod in the jungles of Belize. You know, there are many different kinds of transportation here in Alaska, like the ship you see behind us. The local folks use it almost as frequently as we would use a bus. Probably the most legendary are the bush pilots. Great distances and rugged terrain are the rule in Alaska. Commercial airlines serve the larger communities, but the only means of transportation in many areas is the bush plane. These light aircraft are as common in Alaska as taxicabs in New York hauling everything from sightseers to construction supplies. I can't tell you what all 21 of our planes did yesterday, but I can tell you what one did. It started off early in the morning going to Prince Rupert, Canada to bring 26, part of a group of 26 travel agents to catch a can. Then it flew some tourists off the Vietnam. We took them back to Misty Fjords National Monument. Then it took people over to one of the native villages, Cloak, families and groceries and parts. It hauled parts for some of the timber mills out in the west coast. And all along in this, the pilot gets to talk to these people, the workers, the, the, what makes Alaska tick. Today's air charter operator is a far cry from the grizzled bush pilot of popular lore. Pilots like Nora Lee Murphy combine business and managerial skills with expertise in the cockpit. For those who make their home in the Alaskan wilderness, the bush pilot is essential to survival and the pilots take the job seriously. What do visitors want to see most in Alaska? The glaciers and mountains. Within its borders, Alaska has more than half the world's glaciers. Perhaps the best known is the Columbia Glacier, as high as a 25-story building. From a bush plane, the view inspires new wonder for nature's creations. And we'll be back with marlin fishing from Walker's Key in the Bahamas after this. Oh, there are a lot of people who drag lures trying to catch blue marlin, but there's only one Captain Billy Black, and we're lucky enough to fish with him this week on Out and About. 
Everybody says, Billy, you don't get excited when you're fishing. Why not? <laughs> That's what it's all about, you know? Really. I loved it. It was great. Every time you see one, it makes up for the 40 hours or 50 hours you put in trolling to get to see a blue marlin, which, you know, that sounds rare, but that's not bad, you know? 40 hours to catch one. We'll see one about every 20, 25 hours. But we did good. We, we were out an hour and a half and had him on yesterday. Surprises the heck out of you when it happens early really? in the day, then. Yeah, that's, 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 what, that's great, you know? But then you feel, well, I hope it's not all my luck, you know, like it was yesterday. Blue marlin. These are real oceanic heavyweights. Fish so powerful and majestic, it took a writer like Hemingway to immortalize their prowess in The Old Man in the Sea. Numerous big blues over 500 pounds have been taken, and many tagged and released from the waters around Walker's Key, and much larger fish have been sighted. Many skippers honestly believe a 1,000-pound blue will be taken soon within the sight of their marina. Thanks to unusual topography, blue marlin fishing begins within 10 minutes of leaving the dock. That's due to the steep drop-offs close where the protective reef platform plummets away. It's along these drop-offs that the largest game fish, like the marlin, cruise in search of food. Marlin are present at Walker's Key all year round, though the heaviest concentrations occur during the winter and spring months. They are taken both trolling artificial lures and natural baits. A great deal of patience is required whether trolling artificial baits like a bagley or a boon or a cut ballyhoo that's been frozen and later rigged. Patience and teamwork, patience and teamwork. That's what's important in marlin fishing. But when it happens, all heck breaks loose. The excitement is real. And it's infectious. Oh, these weed rips there, we just came over with. See the color change in the water right here? Now, this is the kind of water we're looking for when you marlin fishing. You want an edge. Anything made up like that edge there. You see a dark green water on the back side. Hey, 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 hey let's bring bring her. Her. Let's bring her. Bring her. Bring her. Bring her. Bring her. Hit him. Hit him. Hit him. All right. Oh! 
All that work. Pull the hook. Well, that's fishing. Man. Let's do it again. And we'll be right back right after we take time out for these important messages. How long have you been fishing out of Walker's, Bill? It'll be, uh, be eight years from January. Quite a while. It's a long time at one place. Yeah, well, it's it's good fishing, and that's what keeps us around, you know. A lot quick to get in and out. Not not a big job getting in and out to the fishing ground. Not a lot of running time, and, uh, you know, we get a lot of time fishing. And Plus, really good fishing. And the facility's excellent as well, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. It's one of the best. Billy, there's all kinds of fishing in the world, but what makes that blue marlin so special? Well, the way he gets on his tail, I guess, just takes off and does his thing. Just excites anybody that's in the cockpit. He's gonna, they're going to get excited when they see a marlin break the water and start boogieing. Are there special techniques? There's a lot of techniques. Well, there's a, a special lure trolling, and some people use baits, and we live bait them once in a while, but... Uh, Right now, we're using mostly lures, high-speed lure trolling. And that's been quite revolutionary in the industry, hasn't it? Well, it's been doing real well. Uh, the Hawaiians started a long time ago over in Kona, Hawaii, and we've kind of taken up from them because they're catching all the big fish over there, so we've gone to lures. Saves you a lot of time in a tournament, too, doesn't it? Sure, you got more time in the water. Your baits are not you know, out of the water all the time, changing baits and getting new rigs and stuff made up. You know, they're always in the water. And they look as good when they come out of the water as when they go in. Let me ask you a question. Does it really make a difference whether you have a novice fisherman? Well, no. Not if you'll listen to what you got to say. If you, if you teach a man how to hold a rod and uh, the right technique, which most fishermen know, keep a tight line all the time, it's no real big problem. It's more teamwork, isn't it? It's teamwork. Everybody work together and feel good about it and have a good time doing it at the same time. That's not just an excuse in case you let this one off, is it? That's good. That's good now. Yeah, looking good now, Mike. This is a nicer fish than that one this morning. This is a big fish, Billy. Well, I think he may be hooked to the side of the head. He, I don't think he's picking that one this morning. I see his tail. Nice and easy. Let's try it. You know, we don't want to pull the hook. Wahoo, about 80 pounds, approaches the boat. It's devoured in a savage attack by a huge dusky shark. And the fight begins all over again. How those arms feel in there, partner? What arms? I don't even feel any anymore. Use your legs a little more. I am. Pump it back. Well, you're all right. Mike. Yeah. Okay. Just very slowly, and then work them easier. He's getting close now. Yeah, man. 
locate your Wahoo. That's what I told you. That's why fishing is so good at Walker's Key. And we'll be right back right after we take time out for these important messages. One of the nation's largest winter carnivals, the Anchorage Fur Rendezvous, attracts more than 15,000 visitors. All of scenic Anchorage becomes a winter playground. The 10-day affair, known simply as Fur Rondy, is an outgrowth of the old-time trappers' gatherings. They served as a midwinter outlet to trade furs, tell tales, and take part in friendly competitions. There are more than 130 sporting events, ranging from snow machine racing to canine weight pulling contest. Highlight of the Rondi is the 75 mile World Championship sled dog race. Dog mushing is the official state sport of Alaska, but entries come from the lower 48 and as far away as Europe. Not all of the events are deadly serious, except to the contestants. Where else would you find a downhill canoe race held in a city park? With all the hot air generated during Rondi, what could be more appropriate than a balloon race? Other events include ice carving, a gold and silver auction, and the Miners and Trappers Ball. Visitors can try their hands at traditional Eskimo sports, such as the blanket toss. And of course, there's one of America's largest public fur auctions with lively bidding for pelts of bear, beaver, moose, and wolf. It's a far cry from the old trappers gathering, but one thing is unchanged, the spirit of fellowship and fun that makes the Anchorage Fur Rendezvous uniquely Alaskan. And a sport that's uniquely Caribbean is fly fishing for snook. One of the most exciting forms of fishing is fly fishing. It doesn't take much to become a magic wand devotee. And here Mike Kendrick gets a chance to catch his first snook on a fly rod. Well, Mr. John, up home, a lot of the fishermen that I fish with up there makes them mostly the bass fishermen. Tell them about the fishing down here, and they can't, don't believe that you can land uh, and fight a tarpon or the large snook with a fly rod as effectively as you can with conventional tackle. But what I've found is with the fly rod, the length of the rod, you can actually fight a fish. Let the rod, hold the rod tight, hold it up high and let the rod actually do the fighting for you. And you can wear a larger fish down quicker with a fly rod than you can with conventional tackle. Saltwater fly fishing is a little different than your freshwater variety. You see the rods are longer, and you do have a larger reel capacity. On your reel, you use about 180 yards worth of Dacron backing, and this gives you the chance, if a fish really decides to run, to play him for the distance that it will take to land him. In some kinds of saltwater fishing, especially fly rotting, on the flats or in other clear areas, many times it's necessary to make long, delicate, accurate casts. Fishing the mangroves for snook does not require long casts, but they must be accurate. Once you start saltwater fly rotting, it may take you a few trips to learn what you're doing, but when you do, you'll be hooked. Oh, here it comes. I believe he's had it, Mr. John. 
Yeah, he's, yeah he, he's over. He's over. Boy, he's pretty. Come here, big fella. All right, yeah, he's... He's had it, Mr. John. The first three snook that Mike hooked this week, he lost because he tried to bring them into the boat too green. Here he makes sure that his fish is good and tired before he tries to land him. Oh, that's beautiful. Good boy. Oh, isn't he beautiful? Look at that. Oh, he is tired. He is really tired. Look at him. Ah, oh, beautiful fish. Beautiful. Manatee Lodge is located on an estuary system that encompasses hundreds of thousands of miles. It's the main breeding area for the second largest Great Barrier Reef in the world. All species of fish are plentiful. September and October seems to be the best time of the year for the huge snook. They seem to take topwater plugs a lot easier in September and October, although they will hit a topwater plug all year round. Patience is the key when fly rotting for snook. Cast after cast. But the snook that are caught at Manatee Lodge average much larger than the ones that are caught in the United States in the South Florida area, and they're more plentiful. Tarpon are caught all year round as well, averaging in the 60 to 80 pound range. But one thing that seems to be kind of curious, and that is that when the big snook are being caught, the tarpon are not around. January, February, and March seem to be the best month for tarpon and the smaller snook are there also. Snapper, grouper, and other species of fish are also caught plugging the banks. But snook is the main attraction. This week on Out and About, you've seen many exciting vacation destinations. Join me, Mark Fleming, week after week as we take you to places and adventures that are truly out and about. about. 
And now, here's your host, internationally known sportsman, Mark Fleming. Hi, this is Mark Fleming again with Out and About. And this week, we'll be visiting the island of Bermuda, which offers some of the finest diving in the world. Hi, this is Sue Morgan, fighting salmon, Dolly Varden, and grayling from the ultimate destination, Alaska. We'll also be checking out man's efforts to preserve game animals in many different regions of Texas. World record game. Enjoy the thrill of light tackle tarpon fishing in the little Switzerland of the Americas, Costa Rica. Bermuda, a tropical paradise of over 140 islands in the Atlantic, where water sports may be enjoyed all year round. The seven large and 130 small islands total only about 20 square miles, so you'll have ample time to discover all the wonders of this magical island. The turquoise blue waters and pink sand beaches are the main attraction here, although even windsurfing can be enjoyed by the novice after instruction by one of the many professionals, such as Hugh Watlington, Bermuda's Olympic contender. The seven golf courses all have exquisite scenery and oceanside fairways, ranging from the gentle nine-hole ocean view to the challenging mid-ocean club, ranked among the world's top layouts. Cultured and refined, Bermuda is rich in history and tradition. Relax in an old world atmosphere with modern conveniences. Bermuda sightseeing is unsurpassed from the stately mansions with manicured formal gardens to Gibbs Hill Lighthouse, there's always something to catch the eye. St. George, the first capital of Bermuda, still retains the flavor of the 1600s. Picturesque streets are lined with antique shops, museums, and restaurants. Imports from around the world are available here, and touring Hamilton and St. George by motor scooter gives the visitor a close-up look at the island's past and present. The rocky base of the islands also hold enchantment. The Crystal Caves, a popular tourist attraction, are dotted with stalagmites and stalactites. The floors contain pools of crystal clear salt water. Once home to pirates, the azure waters still hold much of their treasure. The ocean surrounding Bermuda is ideal for diving. There is even an underwater wreck museum with over 350 ships, some centuries old, scattered over the island's coral reefs. With four licensed scuba diving operations currently offering resort courses to the first-time diver, Bermuda gives the novice the chance to explore spectacular underwater scenery. Equipment is available on the island, but it's always a good idea to bring your own mask, fin, and snorkel for added enjoyment. Most of the dives are indeed shallow water dives as well.
Diving and snorkeling off Bermuda is a memorable experience, but be sure to place yourself in the hands of experienced guides and instructors if venturing offshore. They live here and understand the importance of treating the sea with respect, even when the waves are calm and the sea is blue. When the outdoorsman discovers Bermuda, he discovers 21 square miles of year-round action. Ketchikan has quite a history. It's been known as the salmon capital of the world, and right now it's the commercial fishing capital of Alaska. It also has become a great tourist capital, and it's the gateway for many kinds of fishing and camping expeditions. Ketchikan is the closest and most economical destination in Alaska. Air travel is the common form of transportation. Pilots fly to many remote regions daily. To most Alaskans, a flight on a float plane is as typical as a New Yorker taking the subway. Rivers, coves, lakes, and glaciers are made accessible through the pilot's skill. Stops can be easily made for accommodating the fishermen, where grayling and trout can be found in abundance. Grayling is a rare fish not found in many Alaskan waters, but on this occasion, Mike Costello caught 11 on 11 casts. When hungry, the grayling will strike almost any pattern, and, as with any rarity, these fish should be released after the catch. Some remote lakes hold only Dolly Varden, others rainbow trout. One of the true joys in fishing is getting a chance to catch a species that you've never caught before. Well, in this segment, Eddie White, Mike Costello, and I are going to have a chance to catch our first coho salmon. And I know it's going to be an experience that we're going to truly enjoy. From Hyder, Alaska. The sister cities of Hyder, Alaska and Stewart, British Columbia are on the spur of the Cassier Highway at the head of the Portland Canal, a narrow saltwater fjord approximately 90 miles long. This forms a natural boundary between Alaska and Canada. Stewart has a deep harbor and boasts of being Canada's most northerly ice-free port. Fish Creek up the Salmon River Road from Hyder is a fall spawning ground for some of the world's largest salmon. Nothing can compare with the fishing action available in this region. Surrounded by mountains, the glacial waters are home to various species of fish. Catching the trophy of a lifetime is more than possible here, standing in the shallows and casting out to deeper waters. The salmon is the king of the waterways, and its physical exploits are legendary. This is one of the most sought after game fish, strong and fast. The fight is characterized by long bullish runs made stronger in the swift glacial current. Many different types of tackle may be utilized, including casting, spinning, or fly rod. One of the goals for me on this particular trip is trying to catch on a fly rod a huge salmon with six pound tippet. For the dedicated fly fisherman, Alaska is a dream come true. Presentation is everything in catching the Dolly Varden, another great sport fish. This fighting fury prefers the cold deep water of the glacier to a trip on shore. Dolly Varden can be taken two to 10 a day depending on your location. Using a fly rod, the comet fly is most effective. For the novice, nothing is more thrilling than a salmon on a spinning rod. Because lures are effective tipped with salmon eggs, 
the first time angler is ensured a success. And half the fun is showing off and admiring your catch. But the real test is the mighty coho salmon on a fly rod. Execution of the catch and landing on a six pound tippet is a very delicate matter requiring deafness of touch and steady control of the fish at all times. The swift current and rocky bottom conspire against the angler to give the fish a fighting chance. Records have been made and broken in Alaska. Not only man takes advantage of the incoming rush of fish, eagles, bears, and other wildlife are on hand for this annual food source. Dave Stevens of Hyder, Alaska is the leading authority in this area. Under his direction, Mike Costello is using a fly rod in an attempt to excite the salmon into feeding. Patience in casting and placement of the fly is all important in achieving that trophy. I'm impressed with Alaska, and Hyder uh, so far has been one of the most impressive spots. Like you said, Mark, I caught my first coho salmon. I caught it on a fly rod with a comet, a fly that I tied, and you and I both caught fish on him today. I got to say that uh, Dave put us on one of the nicest spots I've ever seen in my life. And what impressed me, Dave, was the fact that we got there by road. We didn't have to walk 20 miles to get to it, but yet, uh, if for all intent and purpose, we were the only people on the stream. Yeah, basically. That's one thing. This particular time of the season, things are a little bit quiet, and basically you went to one of the local fishing holes, and uh, probably Hyder not being as well publicized made it probably a little bit better, but the fishing will always be here. We have a long and strong salmon run in that creek, and there's good fishing, and it'll continue, I'm sure. fishing in freshwater can reward those willing to reach the remote lakes and streams. The Hyder Stewart area is unsurpassed in fishing action and accessibility. Enjoy fishing relatively unfished areas with little or no competition. And return home with the fish story of a lifetime. The Hyder Stewart area is accessible by land, sea, or air, and this will be the first season where expeditions of this kind will be commonplace. Alaska has so many spectacular things to see that it's almost impossible to describe them. You know, the world's becoming smaller and smaller every year. There was a time when you had to make both a major investment of time and money to come to places like Hyder, Alaska, but no more. And remember, when you get old and you're sitting in that rocking chair, all you've got is your memories, and if you don't see Hyder, Alaska, you're going to be short. The size of West Virginia, Costa Rica offers green mountains, unspoiled seacoasts on both the Caribbean Sea and the Pacific Ocean, and a year-round temperature of 72 degrees in the highlands. 
Costa Rica is readily accessible by air, land, and sea. Fishing is super on both coasts, and excellent facilities are available for the angler. The rivers and bar mouths of Costa Rica reign supreme as home to the mighty tarpon. Growing to immense size in the warm waters, the tarpon maintains a lofty status as one of the more difficult game fish to hook and land. Once a major seaport, this region's economy was once based on the logging of hardwood, such as mahogany. Small logging operations still flourish in remote regions of the jungle. Relying on the river as a link to the outside for fuel and supplies, the loggers still do much of the work by hand. Fishing is also a large part of the economy here. Winding mangrove canals and broad rivers offer unlimited fishing opportunities for the angler. Someone once said trying to hook a tarpon is like driving a spike into an anvil with a tack hammer. This is particularly true for the light tackle angler. The battle of skill between fish and man becomes an attempt to outwit the tarpon's charging runs and twisting leaps. jungle heat is difficult to contend with, especially when the fight is four and a half hours long. In this particular battle, I lost 16 pounds. With 12 pound tests spooled on the reel, perhaps I was a little bit overmatched. But this will be a fight that I will remember the rest of my life. The lucky folks who actually do get to help hunt with Texas Hunting Services are really a selected few. Because of the number of bucks harvested each year, there are very few hunts that are actually available. And they book many times as much as a year or two in advance. But if you ever get a chance to try this kind of trophy hunting, to actually call up a buck with your horns, and to see the kind of management techniques that are being promised and tried every day in South Texas, you'll know that this is truly white tail magic Bobby this is a beautiful trophy buck uh, in two or three years I wonder what caused its death it doesn't look like it's more than maybe three years old imagine what it'd be hmm. another two or three years Hey, Jim, what you have in most of these ranches, you, you know, there's not that much hunting pressure. A deer like this, I feel like it probably only been, you know, taken probably in the spring of the year or, you know, early fall by either mountain lions, coyotes, maybe something like that. You got a tremendous predation problem in this country. You know, there's definitely no hunting pressure. To most hunters, this would uh, definitely be a trophy in itself. I think there's a lot of whitetail hunters that probably have never seen a buck in this class and probably have never had an opportunity to shoot one. This is a problem, though, in a, in a lot of country, even in, in South Texas and in, in all of America, is although this is a young deer with tremendous potential and 99% and of whitetail habitat and country in America today, this buck would never have had the opportunity to reach three years, you know, much less the six years it's going to take to produce the really record class head. Most deer in, in over-hunted areas of the United States today are, 
killed, you know, by the time they're a year and a half old. They never would have gotten to even this potential. Jim, I don't think that if a, if a guy is as serious about killing a real trophy class whitetail deer, and I'm talking about a buck from 150 to 160, I'm not talking about naturally a Boone and Crockett, but a trophy class deer, you know, it wasn't too long ago that 150 minimums made the Boone and Crockett. I don't think that there's any area in the United States or even North America that has the potential of producing a quantity amount of quality 150 to 160 class whitetail deer than this area of South Texas today. Robbie, of all the species there are in the United States to hunt, what makes the whitetail such a special animal? Jim, the thing that makes whitetail deer so special, I think, to so many people in uh, America today is that, first of all, they're familiar with it because, you know, it's right in the backyard of just about 75% of North Americans, you know, today. Uh, the other thing is uh, it's, you know, s such a, a wary animal. You know, it's the unpredictability of the animal that makes him such a great game animal. You know, you can go in people's homes that um, have collected all the species in the world, and if they don't have a great whitetail on the wall, you know, the first thing a, a guy comes in doesn't know anything about it, says, uh, well, you know, that's, those are real nice trophies, but uh, you got a good whitetail? Yeah. You know, it's something that everybody's familiar with, and uh, just a development of love for an animal, you know, over, you know, hundreds of years. You've heard the expression, one in a million. When talking about whitetail deer, one in a million has a different significance. You see, it really is only one in one million that become true trophies. In South Texas, with proper management techniques being employed now, and after years of trial and error, a system to where perhaps more than one in a million will get to be truly trophy proportions. about. And now, here's your host, internationally known sportsman, Mark Fleming. Hi, this is Mark Fleming again with Out and About. And this week, we're going to take you to Orlando, Florida for the first ever SeaWorld Fishing Exposition. Hi, this is Sue Morgan. Visit the great state of Alaska and enjoy the excitement of the Indian Olympics, modern day games combining old world culture and keen competition. You'll also travel by canoe along some of Florida's pristine waterways. We'll catch bass and other species of fish and much, much more. Hi, this is Mark Fleming again with Out and About. And this week you're going to have the opportunity to see what I consider to be one of the most innovative events in history. That's the first annual fishing exposition here at SeaWorld in Central Florida.
Bill, it seems that the knowledge is there now if you really want to go out and look for it. Things like this really help, but it seems that on a tournament trail now, you don't see the same names because the local guys now have the knowledge. Is the secret now execution? Well, you know, I don't think uh, there's any shortcuts. Uh, the, the key is experience. The more you do of any one particular thing, the better you become at it. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's say a Florida bass doesn't know he's a Florida bass, nor does a Tennessee bass know he's a Tennessee bass. Fish behavior is governed primarily by, say, temperature mm -hmm. as much as any one single thing. Fishermen today are a lot more educated than they were, say, 10 years ago or even five years ago. And a lot of what, uh, say, a shallow water fisherman in Florida has learned, he can apply that technique and method in lakes as far away as Minnesota or even into southern Canada. A deep water fisherman can apply his methods, uh, you know, into other sections of the country. I think the key is versatility. The better you are as far as being able to adjust summer, fall, winter, spring, cold water, hot water, muddy water, clear water, shallow water, deep water, the versatile fisherman is the fisherman that's most successful. Perhaps the most unique part of this kind of demonstration is the fact that not only do the fishermen show the people how to cast, they also show people how to find the fish, which is the most difficult part of fishing. Tommy Martin, Bill Dance, and the others also fielded questions from the audience. Tommy, why is this thing so unique? Well, yeah, this is a great event. You know, it, uh, uh, more and more people are getting involved in bass fishing and wanting to learn how to become better fishermen. And naturally, that's part of our job is educating the people. We've been fortunate enough to spend a great deal of time in the outdoors on different lakes and waterways. And naturally, we've, we've learned a, a lot about bass and how to, how to catch bass. But we're not experts yet either. We're still learning but we are able to teach people to become better bass fishermen, and, and this is a great event. It's a great opportunity for the people to come out and learn. And we'll be back with more of the first annual SeaWorld Fishing Expo after this. And now, SeaWorld of Florida and Out and About present Sea Lions of the Silver Screen. used to be that years ago the only thing a bass fisherman could do was go out and watch you guys win money but now we've got an event finally where they can get out and learn something can't they well i guarantee you you know if they would have had these seminars back when i was 15 or 16 years old i'd have sure got a jump on tommy and bill and some yep. of these other Isn't guys that the truth too you know very informative also when you think about it is that there's actually a chance to have some interchange isn't there because there's questions and there's answers that's right you know you you give a seminar and it sparks a lot of interest and a lot of thoughts that that the fishermen have had on the water and they can actually ask you the question that that you know mm -hmm. came to mind when they were out on the water so it is an opportunity for somebody to really pick up and learn next year i think it'll be bigger and better than ever i guarantee you it always you know the first year you, you start to grow and then it, it, it snowballs it gets bigger you can bring the whole family out to a place like this have a great time Plus, we have five seminars a day. I mean, we're talking about everything from worm fishing to uh, topwater baits and, and tackling it. And it's all educational. And I, I think it's just a great thing to have somebody as big as SeaWorld get behind something like this. And it's going to be great in the future, too, because this was the first of many years. Ahoy there, matey! Everybody loves to play pirates. Everybody loves 
Over the years, you've probably devoted more of your time toward teaching youngsters how to bass fish. That's got to be gratifying, doesn't it? Well, you know, surprisingly, the, 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 I guess it's because I can relate so well back when that's where I started learning was as a kid. And then the enthusiasm of a kid and the positive attitude of a kid, unfortunately, is much greater than most adults. And we tend to get caught up in the world's events and lose our attitudes. But a kid is, uh, you know, again, it's... Nowadays, I see such a different kid than what I used to be fishing. When I used to fish, if I caught a five-pound bass, I'd drag him around the neighborhood for three days until he didn't have any scales left on him. And, and, and nowadays, the kids are much more knowledgeable, and all the way to the point that now, I had a kid call me the other day on the telephone and caught the biggest fish of his life. And the thing that amazed me was after he finished the story, he said, I released the fish. Which, like I said, I would have wouldn't even considered that, you know, back when I was a kid. So, uh, the, everybody nowadays, kids all the way up, are learning more about fishing and seem to be take it much more serious. Uh, I think it's a natural outlet. I, he, mankind has got himself now in a situation where we spend all the, our time in little boxes inside houses and in offices, and we still have a connection to the outdoors, and and, and we and we vent that connection many times through going fishing or going, you know, doing other things. Ricky has said before, I spend my time chasing these little green creatures. But he also does his part to make sure that they're released so there are little green creatures for us. In the early days of bass fishing, there were no events such as this where a bass fisherman could come to learn from the pros. In fact, in the early days, the pros were still learning themselves. But we know that this will be a trend that is going to continue and one that we really like. And we'll be back with the Alaskan Indian Olympics after this. This is not Los Angeles, but these are the Summer Olympic Games. The Olympic flame flickers, but from a lamp of seal oil. The contestants are native Alaskans. This is the World Eskimo Indian Olympics, held every year in the main gym on the Fairbanks campus of the University of Alaska. It's often said that the famous blanket toss was used to look for whales or seals. In fact, however, this was how villages celebrated any successful marine harvest. Once whales were captured, this aerobatic maneuver, the Alaskan high kick, summoned villagers to complete the harvest. This is muktuk, one cubic inch of whale skin and blubber. The first empty mouth is the winner. Walking a greased pole would have sharpened the balance and agility needed to go from ice flow to boat and back again. Not every event is deadly serious. Eskimo and Indian villages found ample reason for festive dances and celebrations. The traditions have not been lost. Another great tradition is canoeing Central Florida. A fisherman must really be able to adapt when trying a strange stream or lake for the first time. The best thing to do is always seek out local fishermen for advice. There is no assurance, however, that this valuable information will be given out easily. There is even less assurance it will be reliable because of the ever-changing patterns of the bass. Your canoe is now one of your greatest assets in these quarters. It can silently slide into seldom visited corners, providing that much needed mobility to seek out the cagey bass 
whose location is bizarrely unpredictable. No one can truly anticipate the actions of the shifty bass, map his slippery activity, or understand his inconsistencies. This makes him a prime target for fishing experts and beginners alike. Each day, more and more fishermen are trying to figure out the patterns of the bass, who is not always where the angler thinks he ought to be. Basically, the bass is not a chaser and will strike his prey from ambush. Primarily a near bottom resident, the bass will sometimes travel above the tops of submerged grasses or just under floating lily pads. Not easy to trick with artificial lures, the bass will reject any that aren't just right and the hook has to be set perfectly. Even so, the bass may suck in the lure, taste it, and then blow it back again before the fisherman can react. Some fishermen are better than others, however. They don't have any real secrets, though. They just know all the tricks, and when one doesn't work, they change to another. A method that worked yesterday to catch bass might not work today under identical conditions. And the good fisherman will always try a new approach once he sees this. There's a certain frustration in fishing for bass who sometimes won't bite on any kind of lure you offer, no matter how it was made to swim, spin, creep, crawl, or hop through the water. Several types of lures should be included on a trip like this, primarily a shallow runner, surface popper, a spinner spoon, and several differently colored rubber worms. Two complete sets of rods and reels are a must. Casting is a very important part of fishing for bass. Now, using a canoe enables the fishermen to cast in any direction after positioning themselves to fish towards the shore, away from the shore, or parallel to the shore. Even more important than prowling for a trophy bass or just catching supper for the night, this type of activity offers a challenge that is answered by millions of people each year and more and more every following year. At a time when everyone wants to live as an individual, this game of underwater hide and seek can be played as casually or as seriously as you want. Back with more after this. Look and you may spot an egret under the bushes along the bank and turning his neck down to drink water from the stream. If quiet, you can sneak up to him in the canoe because the birds remain relatively unafraid of man. In flight, a white heron with a five-foot wingspan sails without noise above the treetops. Walking through the lily pads might be a broad-billed grebe, a giant blue heron, a white ibis, or a sandhill crane. Up above, you might see an owl looking at you as if to say, what are you doing here? the waterway are the many diverse forms of wildlife, not yet chased by man, even further into the wilderness, which is becoming more rare. In the central Florida heartland, there still remains a wealth of undeveloped land and an unlimited potential for discovery. While urban cities continue to be choked by air pollution and smothered in water pollution, virgin areas like this represent the modern concept of development.
One comes away from a trip like this with a brand new appreciation for the land, the wildlife, and how man fits into the scheme of the entire system. On his own, modern man can become more aware of how everything fits together like a giant living puzzle. Man must always keep in mind, however, that this puzzle is also constantly changing. As life evolves, the roles change. Nothing is really like it was the day before, although some areas of wilderness appear to be frozen in time. Most people cannot make ecology their main project in life, but everyone can and should enjoy what wilderness is left. Perhaps the most important thing you can do is to simply leave the land the way you found it. In this way, the next guy will be able to savor the same experiences you had. And if you're lucky, unmarred areas similar to this may be found only an hour or so from home. It remains for all who can understand the simple, uncomplicated life, or for those who wish they could. The serenity of unspoiled nature can be like the recharging of a battery for most people. Instead of having your work, money problems, or other pressures to depress you, a few days in the wilderness will pick up your spirits and renew an optimistic look at life. The age-old conflict between man and vast will be repeated millions of times more, each similar and yet each a totally new confrontation. Even if a man gets only one chance to fish, at least he's had that one precious fling to test his intuition and instincts in a prehistoric situation where one has to rely on all his senses for success. North to Alaska. The Alaskan brown bear. The polar bear. That relic of the ice age, the musk oxen. All symbols of a rich past, celebrated for visitors in a world-class museum in Fairbanks. Classes are hosted by the museum, run by the University of Alaska, so that youngsters can learn about the fine native arts on display. A recent find is this mastodon skull, preserved in plaster until it can be mounted for exhibit. Just one of the attractions which draw 100,000 visitors a year to the museum. One of the common notions that many people have about Alaska that it's a land of, of snow and ice 365 days a year, but when they come into the interior of Alaska during the summertime, uh, they're surprised to find the mild continental climate that we have, and they're especially surprised to find the high quality museum that we have here at the university. People are very much uh, excited about the museum, and uh, they walk away uh, knowing much more about Alaska than they did when they came in. With its outstanding exhibits and frequent lecture programs for the public, the museum has become a favorite attraction for visitors to central Alaska. And this is your host, Mark Fleming, saying catch you next time right here on Out and About.